Jacob Burton here from StellaCulinary.com. And in this episode of Food Science 101, we'll be discussing the science behind pressure frying. Now, we can't really have a discussion about pressure frying without first mentioning its inventor, this gentleman right here, Colonel Harlan Sanders, who you may recognize from his Kentucky Fried Chicken fame. However, Colonel Sanders wasn't always a fried chicken mogul. In fact, he didn't even get into the culinary industry until much later in life. And when he did, he started very humbly selling fried chicken at a roadside stand in Corbin, Kentucky during the Great Depression. Now, this eventually led to him opening up his own restaurant serving his southern fried chicken recipe. And although he was able to amass a pretty solid following, he had one major problem. And that was his southern fried chicken took about 35 minutes to cook from start to finish. Now, one day, he went to a demonstration that showed him how to use a pressure cooker for cooking vegetables. And in this demonstration, they said, hey, you know, you throw the vegetables in the pot, you seal it with this lid, you let it come up to pressure. And this raises the boiling point of the water in the vegetables, which then allows them to cook faster. Now, Sanders walked away from this demonstration thinking, you know, if I took this concept and applied it to my fried chicken, not only could I get it to fry faster, but I might even end up with a better finished product. So Sanders went and hit the drawing board quite literally. I mean, this is Colonel Sanders' original diagram that he drew and submitted with his U.S. patent filing 3,245,800 back in 1966. And in this patent filing, he walks us through his new novel approach, something that he calls pressure frying. And he states that grease, oil, or other cooking compound is first placed in a container and then brought to a temperature of 350 to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, the raw chicken is then coated with a moist layer of breading placed in a cooking compound whereupon the oil drops to a temperature of 250 degrees to 275 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, once the chicken is brown and the oil temperature has dropped, he seals the lid on the container and the pressure is allowed to build to approximately 15 pounds or 15 PSI. Building up pressure usually takes from one and one and a half to two minutes, according to Sanders' patent filing. And this temperature and pressure are maintained for a period of about eight minutes or until the chicken is fully cooked through. So Sanders' basic method was to place the oil in a pressure cooker and heat uncovered until it reached about 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, this would brown the chicken rapidly. And if you've ever fried chicken before, you understand that if you drop your chicken into a 400 degree vat of oil the exterior is going to brown very rapidly but the interior is going to remain raw but this was part of sanders master plan so once the chicken browned rapidly in the very hot oil he would then seal the pressure cooker with the lid and cook at 15 psi or what we know to be 250 degrees fahrenheit for about eight minutes or until the chicken was cooked all the way through now, at this point, he would vent the pot just like you would in any other pressure cooking situation, drain the chicken, serve the chicken, and most importantly, profit, which he did in a very major way. This new approach to pressure frying chicken basically spawned a fried chicken empire. Now, before we move on, I must warn you that what Colonel Sanders did was extremely dangerous. Modifying pressure cookers is never a good idea, and trying to bring them to temperatures that are necessary for deep frying is a horrible idea because the gaskets can fail, all sorts of bad things can happen to where you basically end up with a bomb in your kitchen that is shooting hot oil everywhere, which will ruin your day at the very least. So please do not do this. And Mr. Sanders understood how dangerous this really was, which is why he went out and he hired people or he asked people to bid on this new project to create him a commercial pressure fryer that he could use in his restaurants. So here is a crudely drawn cross-section of a modern-day uh, commercial pressure fryer. And again, I stress crudely drawn, but if we basically take that pressure fryer and cut it in half and we're able to look inside, this is basically what it's going to look like. So they're going to fill it with high smoke point frying oil and all around the midsection where most of the frying gets done, they have electric heating elements spaced evenly and this allows the oil to heat very evenly and at a very rapid pace. Now to help maintain the oil temperature and the consistency of the cook, insulation is wrapped all the way around the main frying section of the pressure fryer. 
Now next you have a basic cooking rack that's loaded with chicken and you have multiple layers. So the chicken is loaded in a single layer on this rack. And this allows for all the food to be loaded into the pressure cooker simultaneously, which promotes even cooking. Now once the chicken is loaded into the pressure cooker, the lid is applied and it's sealed really tight uh, so a pressure is allowed to build. Now as that pressure builds, it raises the water's boiling point to about 223 degrees Fahrenheit or 106 degrees Celsius. Now as the chicken browns, brown food particles are going to be released from the food and these are going to fall to the bottom of the pressure fryer into an uninsulated cold zone so the particles don't burn. So at, even after the chicken is removed from the fryer, these particles will remain, but because of how the pressure fryer is engineered, the uninsulated cold zone keeps these particles from burning, which can adversely affect the longevity of your oil and also the flavor of your oil. Now, raising the pressure gives a few distinct advantages over traditional frying. Number one, the collagen in, in tough pieces of meat like leg and thighs break down much faster at higher pressures or higher temperatures, yielding a tender product with less cook time. Less moisture from the product is evaporating, leading to a juicier piece of meat. And less moisture being released into the oil means less hydrolysis, so the oil will last much longer because water in oil will break those bonds of the long fatty chains, creating more free-form fatty acids, which lowers the smoke point of your oil. So this way, you're getting a better end product with more longevity in your oil, which is very important if your entire business structure revolves around frying chicken. Now, the question is, why did Colonel Sanders fry his chicken at 15 PSI or 250 degrees Fahrenheit when today it's done at 223 degrees Fahrenheit or only about 5 PSI? And the answer is, well, back in Colonel Sanders' day, they just didn't make chickens like they used to. I mean, back then, the chickens were much tougher. Uh, in fact, they were butchered 10 weeks later than they are today. So older animals means more collagen. More collagen means tougher meat, and tougher meat means you have to cook it longer and or at a higher temperature to break down the collagen and make it tender. Now, so what are some of the key takeaways from this discussion? Well, increased atmospheric pressure causes the boiling point of water to rise, leading to a product that's cooked faster and maintains more of its juices since less moisture evaporates into steam. The insulated walls and evenly dispersed heating elements keep an even constant temperature for more accurate frying. And the uninsulated cold zone collects particles and keeps them from burning, making your frying oil last longer. Because less moisture is released from the meat into the oil, the fried product will not only stay juicier, but your fry oil will last longer since water is the natural enemy of oil. And plus, most commercial pressure fryers are self-filtering, which means it further extends the life of your oil and helps to recoup the initial investment of the pressure fryer if you run a business that sells lots and lots of fried food. And that's it for this episode of Food Science 101. Stay up to date on all of the Stella Culinary Educational content by signing up for our free email newsletter. You can just click that bar there in the bottom of the uh, video screen. And this video's show notes, along with links to supporting information and our student discussion page, can be found at stellaculinary.com slash fs10. 